Hello, my name is Jan Krämer and I'm professor for internet and telecommunications business at the University of Passau and academic co-director at SER. In this short video, I'd like to give a brief, brief introduction into how data portability and interoperability affect competition in digital markets. First, let us clarify what is meant by data portability and what is it good for. So imagine you have data at a content and service provider, CSP, and you want to give that data to another content and service provider. Data portability would mean that you first give consent to the content and service provider where your data is currently being hosted, and then that content and service provider would be able to give that data to another content and service provider, but it's not limited to that. Data can also be ported to a personal data store, whether in the cloud or on your personal computer, or it can also be ported to what is known as personal information management systems. This is software that manages the data for you and also is able to share data on your behalf with other content and service providers, for example. Now, what kind of data can be ported? This is a key question in data portability to start with. We have to differentiate between personal data and non-personal data, and potentially also data that's relating to others. For example, chat protocols usually are not provided only with your own data, but also contain data of others that you were chatting with. In the context of personal data, we have to differentiate again between data that was provided by you, for example, your name or your address, and data that is observed by using the service. So these can be clicks that have been recorded, songs that you liked at the music streaming service, for example. And then there is inferred data. Data that is inferred about you, for example, what your tastes are, what your um, likes and dislikes are from the data that has been provided or observed. And also in the context of non-personal data, data can be provided. This can be, for example, documents or data can be observed or inferred. It is currently understood that with data portability, you can only port data that you have provided or that you have implicitly given through clicks, for example, or likes, so data that is observed, but not data that is inferred about you. And also, in context of non-personal data, this is usually limited to data that's being provided. Another key question is uh, containing data portability is what is the scope and the type of data that is being able to, that you're able to port? Is it only personal data or non-personal data? As I said before, provided and observed data is usually considered to be in the scope of data portability. Then also the scale of the data transfer, how much data can you transfer? The timeliness of the data, how fast do you have access to that data? How, how recent is the data that you can access? And how long is the data that dates back um, that you can access? The frequency at which you can access, do you have a continuous access? So you, can you continuously port data from one provider to another, or can you only do it once a month or only just once at the end of a subscription, for example? And the data format is crucial. In which format is the data being provided? Is it provided through an application programming interface, API? Is it provided just in a zip file? Is it in HTML? Is it a CSV file? It can be many, in many different formats, and that will have an impact on how useful it is also for further use. Now, what are some of the effects now of data portability potentially on competition? And I want to highlight two main effects. One is that through data portability, data-enabled learning effects can be enabled at other parties. So there's commonly understood that in digital markets, there is a virtual cycle where more data allows you 
to devise better algorithms, which means you can have a better service, which then attracts more users, which gives you more data. And that virtual cycle can also constitute entry barriers and limit competition if you don't have access to it. So another content and service provider, potentially with a smaller current user base, would have less data, a worse algorithm, a worse service, and will have been struggling, will be struggling to compete. Now with data portability, data can be shared and that virtual cycle can also be driven at another content and service provider. So that would mean that with that new data, innovation can happen also outside of the context in which the data was originally created. That can lead to more innovation and that can then drive competition between different service providers. So that is a key argument why data portability would stimulate competition. Another argument is that data portability will reduce switching costs. So if a consumer wants to switch from one service provider to another service provider, he or she can just take the data with her and then would have access to the same personal data provided and observed or non-personal data provided data at the other content and service provider. But there can also be some unintended consequences possibly associated with data portability. I cannot go in much detail here, but studies have shown that data portability can increase a user's inclination to provide data because the user feels more secure that he or she is not locked in with the current provider and that increases the inclination to actually give out data. And it can also increase the inclination of firms to collect data, especially firms that might be on the receiving end, because now they have access to more data and that might increase their hunger for data. And data portability, if it is applied symmetrically to both small firms and large firms, might hurt especially small firms, emerging firms, because they have to bear implementation cost, and they might experience a data drain from the small firm to the already large firm through data portability. And finally, spreading data to more content and service providers also naturally bears a risk for consumers of increased privacy risks. Next, let us discuss interoperability. Interoperability is distinct from portability because it always involves a two-way exchange. In principle, we have to differentiate between data interoperability, so the exchange, two-way exchange of data, and protocol interoperability. In data interoperability, data is exchanged bilaterally between two content and service providers, for example. Here, central questions are is what is the common data that the two parties want to exchange? It can be very simple, like two messenger services exchanging messaging data, but it can be much more complex than that. And there's also a question whether the two parties exchange the data directly or whether they exchange data through some intermediary, for example, a personal information management system. Protocol interoperability, on the other hand, goes beyond data interoperability. Here it is possible to actually invoke functions from one content and service provider at the other content and service provider. So you can invoke an action, for example, post on a timeline or send off a video or something like this. So here the question is, how does that interoperability actually work? Is it two-way? Can you invoke the same functions from one content provider, one content and service provider at the other end and the other way around? Or is it different functionalities that you can invoke, different actions? And what precisely is the scope of interoperability? So how many and which actions can you invoke? What are some of the effects of interoperability on competition innovation. 
Interoperability enables to share network effects. Similar as under data portability, sharing these network effects can drive competition. What is a network effect? A network effect means that as you have more users, this will make the service more attractive to other users or to complementers. So there can be a direct or an indirect network effect. And with interoperability, another content service provider can, ac can access this network and thereby benefit from this network effect, which will then increase competition between the two networks. Another value of interoperability comes when a user wants to multi-home different services. So use different services at the same time. Through interoperability, these services can be in sync with each other, for example, with respect to data or with respect to some functionalities that can be used on one service and uh, on the other service. And that will facilitate switching and multi-homing of a user, so increase user's choice for services. But also with interoperability, there might be unintended consequences that might arise. One concern comes from tacit collusion. So if two content and service providers, two operators work closely together, interoperate with, the, with each other, they might also have a tendency to collude more tacitly. It might lower the incentives to innovate by firms because they uh, cannot evade competition so easily because they cannot build their own network without also benefiting another firm. And they might also be able to differentiate less because interoperability requires them to have common interfaces and to obey common standards. And also with interoperability, there may be privacy risks for consumers. So with this, I want to close this video with some suggestions for further reading on data portability and regulation of digital markets in this context, sharing data, for example.